So what exactly are bacteria? Contrary to viruses, which we made an entire video about, which I'll link below, bacteria are organisms. They're also called microorganisms because of their small size. And it is often stated that they cause disease. But is that actually true? It was first possible to view microorganisms when Antony van Leeuwenhoek invented a capable microscope in 1676. However, he himself didn't suggest any hypotheses about these small entities. He just observed them and made notes about his observations. And this discovery of microorganisms, like bacteria, hold a very strong influence over the entire field of medical science. However, appearances can be deceiving. Dr. Robert Koch, whom is considered to be the founder of modern bacteriology, invented four postulates. And I want to explain the logic behind the very first postulate specifically, and why it is pertinent in ascertaining whether a certain microbe causes disease. The first postulate, the most crucial for discovering a causal agent for a particular condition, is comprised of two criteria. The microorganism should be found in abundance in all organisms suffering from the disease in question, and should not be found in healthy organisms. The logic behind the very first postulate is clear and obvious. So this means, by definition, that a single exception to one of both criteria means that the microbe cannot possibly be the cause of the disease in question. However, research on bacteria and their association with various diseases reveals the existence of exceptions for both criteria of the first postulate. Bacteria have been found in people who do not have the disease they are supposed to cause, and the relevant bacteria have not been found in people who do have the disease they are supposed to cause. A gentleman called Dr. Bado Bailey indicated that the diphtheria bacillus was missing in 14% of clinical diphtheria cases. Also, another gentleman called Dr. Walter Haidwin from England quoted Dr. Muthu from the Mandip Hill Sanatorium, one of the most experienced people in the area of tuberculosis. He said, During 50% of tuberculosis cases, there was no sign of a tuberculosis bacillus. Dr. Haidwin stated himself that nobody has ever found a tubercle bacillus during the early stages of tuberculosis. So because of this, certain adjustments had to be made to the theory. One of the most prominent adjustments to the theory was the idea that bacteria can reside in people without causing the particular condition they are meant to cause. This is also described as asymptomatic carrying. The implication of this label is that carriers of these germs can still transmit those germs to other people who then become infected and eventually develop the disease. Now, this label fails to provide any explanation for the situation and only raises more questions because there are absolutely no explanations for the fact that asymptomatic carriers do not get sick themselves. It is simply claimed that these people have a latent infection. But the entire concept of latent infection directly contradicts the core claim of the entire germ theory, which is that bacterial infections cause disease. Simply put, if a germ causes a disease, it has to cause that disease. If it doesn't cause that particular condition, then it simply isn't the cause of it at all. A purported disease agent, which has been associated with the idea of asymptomatic carriers, is a common bacterium, called Staphylococcus. It has generally been argued that a staph infection causes illness. However, it has been recognised that this bacterium can be found on the skin of healthy people. This strange situation fails the first postulate of Koch. Therefore, the bacterium cannot be regarded as a disease agent. Enter Louis Pasteur. He believed that bacteria could not be found within a healthy body, and that the body was completely sterile. However, the erroneous nature of this claim was revealed in experiments where people tried to keep animals completely germ-free. So what they did is they gave these animals sterile food and supplements, and they kept them inside of sterile environments. And in a matter of days, all of the animals died. This demonstrates that microbes are essential to our well-being. 
And if nature wanted us germ-free, then we would be. So ecos the ecosystems of uh, sentient beings like animals and humans are largely dependent upon the activity of so-called germs. And this has a purpose, as we'll see. Also, I mentioned an uh, animal studies, but I want to address that I am against vivisection, so experimenting on animals, which we'll discuss in a future video. Louis Pasteur also wasn't someone whom you could say had a clean slate. Pasteur misled the world and other scientists with his two most famous experiments. And this was revealed after uh, Pasteur gave the notes on his experiments to his heirs, with the exception that they would never publish it. However, his grandson, whom apparently didn't place Pasteur on much of a pedestal, donated the notes to the French National Library, and they eventually published the notes. Then, a gentleman called Gerard Geisen analyzed the notes and indeed discovered immense fraud. Like when he tried to induce anthrax in vaccinated and unvaccinated animals, the experiment was deemed a success because the unvaccinated animals died and the vaccinated lived. But this wasn't because they died of anthrax, it was because Pasteur poisoned the unvaccinated animals to give the impression that he had proven something significant. And he also stated that he could simply not induce an illness with a pure culture of bacteria, so just bacteria, but that he often uh, injected ground brains of animals into other animals to prove contagion, as he did with rabies. In short, he clandestinely tried to make it seem as if he had proven something new. He eventually gave up and admitted that the entire effort to prove contagion was a failure. And this led to his famous sentence, the germ is nothing, the terrain is everything. So what does he mean by that? What is this terrain he's referring to? Does it cause disease? <laughs> no, not at all. And we'll talk more about it in the future. Also, this doesn't mean that there are good and bad bacteria. There's just bacteria and their misinterpretations. We have to understand that they remove a piece of tissue or blood or mucus from the body, which has been removed from its natural environments, a living human body. It once was an integral part of a intact living structure, but now it isn't anymore. It is now dead, rotting material. So they see bacteria chewing on things inside of this dead sample. And they make the conclusion that they therefore cause disease inside of our living human body. Also, to be able to view bacteria under a microscope, certain preparations are conducted as well. We talked about the electron microscope extensively, but the same procedures are applicable to the light microscope. Bacteria are almost always fixed and stained before being examined under a microscope. It is said that these procedures make it easier to view bacteria. Dr. Koch, for instance, also used fixation and staining methods. Now, it may be that procedures like this can support the observations of bacteria. However, it is totally inappropriate to make conclusions about their actions inside of a living human body purely from the observations of their presence inside of a poisoned, rotting tissue sample under a microscope after being subjected to fixation and staining. So you could compare this to a large fire. It's like saying, because firefighters are present at the site of fire, that this means that they are the cause of the fire. Just because you can find them at the site of every fire, when they are in fact cleaning up the mess. Bacteria are garbage eaters, to put it colloquially, for they are very efficient in biodegrading dead material. Because this is their role, if you will, because they are saprotrophic, meaning they break down dead organic material and they release the nutrients into the environment, which are then consumed by other organisms. And this symbiotic relation with their environment is what makes them so essential for life. And they do this in a vast amount of environments, like the roots of plants, for instance, where they fix nitrogen and convert it into the proper form for the plant to absorb. So they sustain the life of the plant, 
And they do the same with us. Bacteria live in the digestive system of humans and animals. For they process food we eat and release the vital nutrients for the absorption by the body. This is also known as the intestinal flora. In other words, they are vital for life. The reason that tubercle bacilli weren't present during the early stages is because they arrived during the aftermath to clean up the mess. And another misinterpretation regarding bacteria is that many people believe that there are thousands and thousands of variants of bacteria. But this isn't true because bacteria are known to be pleomorphic, meaning they can adjust their form, they can adapt, I should say, to the current environments. So when they are testing uh, certain antibiotics on bacteria, these bacteria adjust their form, they adapt to the environments to be able to survive. And this is immediately interpreted as another mutant variant of a bacterium, which is resistant to that particular antibiotic. Now, a uh, bacterium which is known for being pleomorphic is the Deinococcus radiodurans. An article called Nutrition-Induced Pleomorphism and Budding Mode Reproduction in Deinococcus radiodurans states that they observe different morphotypes of the bacterium by varying the culture medium concentration. They also state that the conflicting aspect of the true morphology of the bacterium in natural environments and observed morphology in laboratory conditions always post questions to microbiologists. Speaking of the Inococci, bacteria are very sturdy, for they can withstand very extreme conditions, like high temperatures. The Thermus aquaticus, for instance, can tolerate very high temperatures, above 70 degrees Celsius, which is also a significant one, and we'll talk more about them when we will discuss the PCR method. And another thing that people might say is, well, I felt good after taking antibiotics, especially penicillin. And allow me to explain why that really is. You felt better after taking penicillin, not because it works, but because of the endocrine system, which is comprised of all of the glands in our body that regulate our hormones. So as the body tries to excrete it, the penicillin, because of its toxic nature, the adrenal glands become hyperactive, resulting in the reduction of pain, fever, and other symptoms. So these reductions are not accomplished by the antibiotics, but because of the workings of the human body. A statement by Dr. Lynn Margulis, whom we mentioned in a former video, is very apropos. Microbes, especially bacteria, are touted as enemies and denigrated as germs. Now, the truth is, the reason that medical science is so reluctant to leave this old paradigm, this old superstition, is very obvious. Here we must understand that there is no money to be made with causes like toxins in food, pharmaceutical drugs, air pollution, electromagnetic radiation, and other chemicals, such as pesticides. On the contrary, banning these would mean huge profit losses for the manufacturing and processing industries, as well as for the pharmaceutical, chemical, telecom and automotive industries, as well as for the vested media, which makes profits from advertisements of these industries. In contrast, the germ theory is paving the way for profits in the billions, with the sales of vaccines, pharmaceutical drugs, tests, you name it. Ergo, it is very clear why such a change wouldn't be of much benefit financially to the people with vested interests. With this in mind, we see that so many things that we've been taught about health and the causes of disease weren't true at all. And in the future, we will discuss the real nature of disease, which has its misinterpretations as well. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you soon. Thank you.